Alright, so without further ado, we are going to start the Nespresso Masterclass. So for those who are late, you can just join later. Okay, so for the benefit of those of you who are around, we will begin the class itself. Alright, so just to introduce myself, okay, my name is Samuel, I'm from Nespresso. So we are here today as part of this uh, collaboration with Samsung. They have a very beautiful uh, event ongoing, uh, Epic Wonderland. So we actually have this uh, masterclass today to share with you on how to appreciate coffee better. At the same time, not only will you be drinking coffee, okay, in the second half, I'll be teaching you how to create a very nice, refreshing iced coffee mocktail. Especially since you look at the weather outside, so hot, every day in Singapore, so humid. So nowadays, there's this trend towards uh, creating iced coffee recipes. So I'll be teaching that to you in the second half of the session itself. And then after which, I'll hand over to another speaker who will share with you a little bit more about uh, food photography, how you're able to take very nice uh, photos okay, using your new Samsung phone. Because nowadays, you know, when you're creating coffees, food, you want it to look very good, right? Especially when you upgrade on your, uh, update on your Instagram, on your social account. So that's a very important part. Okay, but without further ado, in today's session, I'll take you through three things. Okay, I'll share with you a little bit more about the machine. Just now, earlier I asked, who over here, you know, have used an espresso machine? Most of you mentioned you have, so that's great. Okay, but you may or may not have heard of this new system that we have launched. It's called the virtual system. All right, so what makes it so different from your usual coffee machine is that, you know, just like Samsung in Nespresso, we're all about innovating, about smart things, am I right? And nowadays, when it comes to coffee, you also realize that coffee is something that's evolved a lot over the decades. In the past, people drink coffee just for the caffeine, for the boost, instant coffee. But you see, coffee has evolved into more of an artisanal beverage. Now, it's not just important to drink your cup of coffee. People want to know where your coffee is from what kind of beans you are using, the roasting, etc. Alright, so with the virtual machine, what we actually do is to marry both of these together, whereby yourself as a consumer, you may not be an expert barista, but you still want to have the best in-cup result in your, in your coffee, right? And of course, with the whole added convenience. Nowadays, it's all about one touch, one swipe, one gesture. So we offer that with our machine as well. Just to illustrate a point, okay? Before we even get into the coffee, you will see that you already have some coffee capsules in front of you. You can pick it up to take a look. Anyone notice anything interesting about the design of the capsule? Come again. Barcode, yes, very good. If you look closely, you'll see that on the circumference itself, there is a barcode. And what's on this barcode? Yes, brewing instructions somewhat. Okay, so very good answer. What you find on this capsule is actually different brewing parameters. So what this means is that when you place your capsule into your Nespresso virtual machine, okay, when you press the button, just a single touch, the machine is able to scan the capsule and it is able to calibrate the brewing parameters. So what does this mean for you is that when you put in different capsules, they all have different barcodes. Some of them, they will give you different sizes of coffee, whether you want to drink an espresso. So for example, in the case of this coffee, the school roll, this is a double espresso, so it's perfect for making your cappuccinos. If you want to pair it with milk, it'll give you 80 ml. But what about this, you feel like drinking a long black, like a larger cup of coffee? That's where you have a capsule like this, the Costa Rica. This gives you 150 ml, we call that a Grand Longo. Of course, there are a lot of other sizes in our virtual range. These are just two, okay, I didn't showcase all, but anytime you want to try, you can drop by our boutique to try. We have one nearby at Takashimaya. So we have sizes like espresso, double espresso, Grand Longo, we even have a mark size capsule that gives you up to 230 ml with just one capsule. So it's all very convenient, one portion, one touch. Okay, but it extends beyond just the volume. There are a lot of other things that are encoded on the barcode. So for example, things like your infusion time, your temperature, your spin rate of the capsule. Okay, so one thing to note about the capsule of our Voto is that when it's inside the machine, it doesn't just brew, it's actually spinning. We call this centrifusion. So that allows your coffee to be a bit thicker. You have a heavier crema and a heavier body as well, which you will get to see in person later. All right, so very smart machine. You don't have to worry how much water to use, what temperature, how long do I need to infuse my coffee. You don't have to do that. All of this will be calibrated by the machine itself. All right, any questions so far before we go on to brewing the coffee? Anyone? No? Okay. So let's go on to brew the coffee together. So to switch on the machine, it's really simple. Okay, each pair of you will be sharing one machine. All you got to do is press the button in the middle. You'll notice the light start to flash. 
This is where the machine is heating up. So normally, you will see it blink for about 25 to 40 seconds. So all our Nespresso machines, they actually heat up very fast. You don't have to wait 15 to 30 minutes like a traditional espresso machine. Let's say you're rushing to leave the house in the morning to go to work. Okay, within 15 to about 40 seconds, your machine should be heated up. And you will notice it once it's no longer flashing, it's a solid light. It means that your coffee is ready to brew. Okay, so who's ready to brew your first cup of coffee? Ready? Okay, I'm going to teach you how to open up the machine first. Okay, so it's really simple. You notice there's this lever here. All you got to do is to slide it all the way like that and then it opens up. Okay, I invite you to try it. If you encounter any difficulty, just raise up your hand. I will go on to assist you or if not, I have some assistance over there as well. Okay, very good. I see all of you managed to open the machine. Alright, so we'll be brewing our very first cup. Okay, we'll be starting with this brown color capsule. This is called the school roll. So like I mentioned, this is a double espresso size coffee. And this one is uh, pretty high intensity, it's an intensity 11. Okay, so just to share with you, for our coffees, we actually have different intensity. What exactly is intensity? Intensity is a term that we use to describe the strength of the coffee. So generally, a higher intensity coffee, you can expect it to be more bitter, there's a longer lingering aftertaste, there's a heavier body, okay? But just a disclaimer, intensity does not equate to caffeine, yeah? Many people have this misconception that higher intensity means more caffeine. That's not necessarily true. Intensity is usually determined by the type of coffee you use and the degree of roasting. Whereas caffeine is more of an innate part of the coffee itself. Okay, so to brew the coffee, very simple. You can follow along with me. Just place your capsule inside like that with the silver part facing the top. Okay, you can take turns to brew, but I'll just show you. So make sure when you close it, lock it back to the original position, the lever. So you have to push it all the way back to the side. Place your cup in front of the machine and just press the button. Okay, when you press the button, notice that the coffee does not come out immediately. Why? It's because it needs to scan the barcode first and at the same time, before brewing, the machine actually engages in a couple of seconds of pre-infusion. Okay, so pre-infusion is a step that is uh, actually quite important in filter, you know, when you're doing filter coffee as well. You have this step called pre-infusion. This actually helps to prepare the coffee for more uniform brewing. Okay, so you can see all the coffee is beginning to brew. Alright, I know the coffee smells very aromatic. It might be tempting to want to drink the coffee after you're done, but please do not drink the coffee yet. Okay, after you're done brewing the coffee, I'm going to share with you a very simple three-step tasting ritual that we use to better appreciate a cup of coffee. All right, and that three step uses our three different senses. So I'll share with you very shortly. Okay, so hopefully even after today, when you go back and drink your cup of coffee, you're able to use these tips and tricks to better appreciate what goes into your coffee. Because at the end of the day, most of us, sometimes we just rush to drink our coffee. But do you know a lot of work goes into growing your coffee? All the hard work by the farmers, the roasters, the people who pick the coffee, who sort the coffee. So you really want to make sure that you take the time to enjoy the coffee, have a mindful moment, don't rush to drink the coffee. And at the same time to identify all the different sensory and quality aspects of the coffee. Okay, does everyone have your coffee? Okay, since you are taking turn, I'll wait for the second person to brew finish your coffee. You know, one of the reasons I always tell people I love my job is because I get to drink on the job. It's like an endless amount of coffee, right? Okay, but at the same time, I also like to share, you know, all the stories that go behind, you know, creating our different coffees because at the end of the day, like I mentioned, a lot of effort goes into curating your cup of coffee that you see. Anyone needs any help? Any point during the class, if you need any help or you have any questions, please don't be shy. You can raise up your hand, okay? This is a safe space. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that there are three steps to appreciating a cup of coffee, right? So can anyone share with me, what do you think is the first step? Smell, I hear smell. 
Sight, yes, someone says sight. So yes, smell is one of the steps, but the very first step is actually sight. We want to look at our coffee. So I want you to raise up your glasses. Imagine you're like having a yam sing or toast. Okay, raise up your glasses. I want you to take a look at your coffee. Okay, what do you see? Any, you see colors? Do you see any layers? Some of you mentioned you see like a light foamy layer on top, right? Anyone knows what's this uh, foamy layer on top? Yes, crema, very good. Okay, anyone heard of this term called crema before? Yes, no? Okay, allow me to explain, yeah? So crema, this foamy layer you see on top, it's not anything extra that we added into the coffee, yeah? Just to share with you, this crema is actually formed from the natural oils of the coffee. So during the roasting of the coffee itself, natural oils actually emerge from the coffee itself and it will coat around the coffee bean. After which, when they grind the coffee, when you brew it under high pressure circumstances, it, it is possible to extract out all these natural oils. And because oils being less dense than water, right, eventually it will float on top, hence forming this crema on top. Okay, and why is crema important? The reason why is because crema is normally seen as an indicator of quality coffee and freshness. So of course, if your coffee has a very nice layer of crema on top, okay, that's an indicator. Of course, you notice some of us have different amount of crema. It's because I brewed my cup first. So crema is something that will dissipate after a while. Okay, so if you brew your coffee a while ago, you start to find that the crema will dissipate a little bit. Okay, but there are a few things that you can tell from the crema as well. Number one is the color of the crema. Okay, so later when you are brewing the second cup, you can compare. But crema can actually range from a very light blondish color to a very dark hazelnut-like color. So in the future, if you are trying out multiple coffees or you get someone to brew you know, different coffees for you, sometimes even before smelling or tasting the coffee, by comparing the color of the crema, it is already possible to tell which coffee is more intense or more darkly roasted. Okay, so now that we are done with the crema, the next step is to smell, right? Okay, so I want you to smell the coffee. Okay, for Skuro, this particular coffee, the profile is more of like a nutty, nutty, earthy kind of aroma. Okay, so you can try it now if you're able to pick that up. Okay, coffee, there are a lot of different kinds of aroma. Some coffees are floral, some are fruity, some are malted. So there are a lot of different kinds of aromas. And you might be wondering, why are there so many different kinds of aromas? The reason why is because in reality, there are over 150 varietals of coffee. Okay, there are two main species. You probably heard terms like Arabica, Robusta, right? But these are basically subspecies of coffees. But within the Arabica family, there are actually over 100 varietals. And within the Robusta family, there are over 50 different varietals. So because there are so many different varietals of coffee, and the way that you roast and brew is different, that gives rise to a lot of different kinds of aromas you can expect from the coffee. Okay, all of you smell your coffee ready? Able to pick up the aroma? Yes, no... So you give me the confused face. Okay, the thing is, if you're unable to pick up much aroma of the coffee, that's perfectly normal. So you don't have to bluff yourself, say, hey, yes, actually I smell the coffee. If you don't smell anything much, it's normal. The reason why is because, remember I was talking about the crema? Crema also serves the purpose of trapping all of these volatile aromatics under the crema itself, within the body. So at home, or even here, when you want to enjoy the aroma, what you actually need to do is, instead of smelling the coffee first, pick up a spoon or stirrer like that, push the crema to the side, okay? We call this folding, okay, the art of folding. So we want to fold the crema, push it to the side, and then quickly smell. Do you notice any difference after pushing the crema to the side, folding it and smelling it, versus when you first smell the coffee? Is there a significant difference? Yes, no? For some of you, yes, right? Because you notice all this while, all the aromatics are trapped underneath the crema. So by pushing it aside, it helps the coffee to release the aroma. Okay. Okay, once you're done, you can put your stirrer inside the cup over here. Okay, we have a cup over here with water, so you can place it in. Okay, the third step and everyone's favorite step is to taste the coffee, right? Okay, so you can taste the coffee, but I also want you to observe how I taste the coffee. All right, so watch very closely, yeah? Do you see how I drank the coffee? Okay, if you didn't see how I drank the coffee, I hope you have at least heard how I drink the coffee, all right? What did I do? I slurped the coffee, right? 
So there's a reason why I slurp the coffee. At first glance, you might think slurping the coffee sounds very uncouth, right? Like why am I slurping drinking the coffee so crudely? Okay, let me just share with you that when it comes to drinking coffee, for coffee experts, we always slurp the coffee unapologetically. So you can go back and slurp the coffee in front of friends. If they think that you're being rude, you can tell them what I'm sharing with you today. So there are two main reasons why we slurp the coffee. Number one, when we slurp the coffee, okay, there's a bit of suction, right? What we are doing is to take in more aromas through our mouth. Because the back of our mouth is linked to our nose, right? There's this area called the retronasal cavity where the back of our mouth is linked to our nose. So by slurping the coffee, we are also indirectly helping to take in more aromas through our mouth. Now, why is this important? The reason why is because when it comes to flavor perception, our sense of smell also plays a very large part. In fact, you know, studies have shown that our sense of smell can actually contribute up to 60% of what we taste. Okay, if you don't believe me, you're probably at a time where you had a blocked nose or a runny nose and someone were to serve you your favorite dish. Do you think you'll enjoy it as much? Or you can try pinching your nose and eating your favorite dish. You don't enjoy it as much, right? So the same concept applies. Second reason why we slurp. Okay, when we slurp, we are helping to spread the coffee more evenly around your palate. Because our tongue is a very complex organ. It's covered by thousands of taste buds. And certain taste buds, they may be more sensitive to different taste profiles. For example, at the back, it may be more sensitive to bitter notes. At the side, maybe more towards the natural acidity, the sourness, and the tip will be sweetness. So that's the reason why when you slurp, you're able to coat as many taste buds as possible. That helps you to better identify the balance of the coffee, the bitterness versus the acidity. At the same time, to kind of feel the texture and the body of the coffee. Okay, so that's the reason why we slurp the coffee. Okay, so if you're ready, I invite you once again, you can slurp the coffee together with me, okay? So when you're slurping alone, sometimes it looks a bit silly, but when everyone is slurping together, don't worry, you don't look silly, okay? So let's slurp the coffee together. All right, you realize after slurping, the coffee is more flavorful. You get to enjoy that kind of like lingering aftertaste. All right, so we are done with the first coffee. Let's go on to the second coffee. Okay, let's brew that together. This coffee is going to give you a grand longo size, so 150 ml. So if you like like a long black, or if you enjoy like your copio larger size, then this is the coffee for you, all right? So you already know how to brew the coffee, so let's brew it together. And then we can do the same three steps and compare the coffee. Okay, if any of your water tank is low, we will go around and help you top up, yeah? While you are brewing your coffee, allow me to share with you a little bit more about this particular coffee. So for Nespresso, we have a lot of different coffees. This particular coffee is called Costa Rica. It's a single origin coffee. And I mentioned that coffee has a lot of different stories, right, on how they are being processed. Okay, and you know, there are a lot of uh, different processing methods. So this particular Costa Rica is in fact one of my personal favorites. So I'm very happy that you get to try it today. And the fun fact behind this coffee, right, is that this particular coffee is sourced from this region in Costa Rica called Orosi. Okay, so if you get to vi visit Costa Rica, maybe you can check out one of these uh, villages. It's called Orosi. And Orosi, they are well known for their hot springs. How many of you here like your onsen, your hot springs? Okay, so the interesting thing about this coffee, right, is that after harvesting this coffee, the farmers will ferment these coffees in the hot springs of Orosi. Okay, so when they ferment it, the hot springs actually contain minerals. So this allows all these minerals to be absorbed by the coffee. That adds an added layer of flavor to the coffee. So for this particular coffee, because of these minerals, you'll find that the aroma is a bit more of like a malted cereal kind of aroma. All right? Do you all ready have your coffees? See, now this coffee very good life. can enjoy hot spring also, right? Okay, and you can see that for this coffee, the crema is much thicker. Like I mentioned, each capsule has its own brewing parameter. So for the Costa Rica, because it has a faster spin rate, they spin the capsule faster, the crema is actually a lot thicker, okay? So if you already have your coffee, you can proceed to do the three step, which is to look at the color of the crema. Okay, this one is a medium rose. 
but the intensity is lower than the school roll, so the crema is not as dark compared to the school roll. Okay, for those of you who are still brewing, not to worry. For this part, the tasting ritual itself, because you already know the steps, so if you have your coffee, you can proceed to low, and then you can remember what I said about folding in the crema. Okay, just make sure you push it to the side. Of the crema is really thick, what you can also do is to stir it a little bit, just to mix in some of this crema into the coffee. That gives it a more creamy kind of texture. All right? And if you want to compare the differences in the aroma, after smelling this coffee, you can go back and smell your Skuro. Skuro is more of like a nutty, earthy kind of coffee. Your Costa Rica is more of a malted cereal kind of aroma. Okay, and sometimes you also find that, you know, when you have different coffees to compare, when you smell the coffee, the differences are a little bit more distinct. How's everything here? All okay? Okay, by the way, if you can't finish the coffee, that's fine, yeah? Because some of you already had a very full lunch. So not to worry about finishing the coffees. Okay, most importantly is for you to experience the coffee. And then, of course, learn all the tips and tricks I'm about to share with you today. If you cannot finish the coffee, that's fine. Do you want water? Okay. Of course, after this class, at the same time, if you feel that you still want even more coffee, Okay, for the remainder of the event, we will have an espresso coffee bar here, serving other coffees as well. Okay, so there's always something for everyone. Okay, I've been talking a while, so I'm also a bit thirsty. Okay, so give me a chance to drink my uh, Costa Rica. Okay, so you can see that Costa Rica compared to the Scuro, yes, you have a lot more volume, it's a long go, but the body is a lot lighter because the school roll is a double espresso. This is more like, like a long black. So you notice that this one, the body is lighter, the aftertaste doesn't linger as long, and it's generally less bitter. Okay, so one thing to note, for coffee, it's not always about volume. You also want to look at the bitterness, the body, the aroma. Of course, when it comes to coffee appreciation, typically when I conduct a class, I like to do it black, so you can really taste the natural aromas of the coffee. But back at home, if you are more of a cappuccino drinker, flat white drinker, feel free to add milk, and then you can actually in observe how the coffee and the milk interact. And not just cow's milk. Nowadays, there's also a trend towards plant-based milk, right? Alternative milk. Some people like to pair their coffee with oat milk, almond milk, soy milk. So really, there's a lot of endless possibilities with our machine, and then of course your coffee, and the way that you choose to prepare your coffee. Alright, and talking about different ways to prepare the coffee, I'll be moving on to the next segment, which is a very special recipe that I created for this event itself. It's an iced coffee cocktail. Okay, so if you are ready, okay, my assistants will go around to help you clear the glasses as we prepare you for the next segment, which is a hands-on coffee creation. Alright? Okay, as they are clearing, just give us a minute or two to help you prepare for the next segment. After this, game. Alright, so while my assistants are going around to help you prepare for the next segment, maybe what I can do now is to just introduce to you the coffee and the ingredients so that once they are ready, we can begin brewing, okay? So this particular recipe is called the 
spicy mango mint cooler. Okay, so just to introduce the ingredients. For the coffee itself, we are using a single espresso. This is called the Altisio. So it's a Robusta and of intensity 9 with very rich dark cocoa notes. Okay, and this particular recipe, it's kind of inspired or rather a variation of the espresso tonic. So we'll be using a little bit of uh, tonic water. Okay, anyone here for the first time drinking tonic water with coffee? So to use an exotic ingredient, right? You never thought that, you know, carbonated water can go well with coffee. Today, you'll get to taste and find out, all right? But this is not the strangest of ingredients you'll see, all right? Okay, next, we have some mango syrup, okay, inside our cup. So I've added about 10 ml. Of course, if you want it more sweet later, we can always add more for you. Of course, for any iced coffee recipes, we'll be adding some ice cubes as well. Next. What is this? Okay, I know Singaporeans, we love spicy food, right? Chili, right? So have you ever imagined that chili could go into your coffee? No? Okay, so that's great. Because then later when you try it, you'll have a different uh, experience based on your expectation, okay? But very important thing to note, okay? Chili can also be used in coffee creations and not just culinary. In fact, we also have recipes uh, that you mixes chili with chocolate. Anyone tried before like a chili chocolate? So you can find that chili actually has an amazing property where it is able to bring out certain flavors, okay? But in the case of this application with the tonic water, what effect we're trying to create is more of like a minty, menthol-like effect, okay? So that's why we're using the chili. But important thing to note, when you're adding in the chili, okay, please don't cut the chili or whatnot, okay? We'll just be muddling it a little bit because if you cut the chili, then yes, the chili will overwhelm the coffee. But we're just going to be dipping the chili into the tonic water later. Okay, and last but not least, we have some mint leaf just for garnish, all right? So I call this recipe the spicy mango mint cooler. All right, anyone still don't have your setup yet? Okay, we'll just wait for a few more minutes. Okay, based on the ingredients and coffee that I've shared with you, any comments, questions or feedback so far? I can see a lot of you are, have that anticipation phase, like what is this going to taste like? There's carbonated water, there's chili. So you're probably imagining all the different possibilities. Come again? Not enough time to appreciate it. After this, you can still try more coffee. Yeah, because usually, you know, it's bigger cups, so if you can't finish, that's fine. Okay, and not only will I teach you how to create a recipe, I'll teach you how to make the recipe look nice as well. Because, you know, nowadays, food photography, right? People want their food to look nice. So I'll teach you some of the tips and tricks in order to create a very beautiful recipe. So for example, one instance is that you notice that we put in the syrup into the glass first. Because syrup is very dense, right? You will sink. So that already helps to create an additional layer. And then later when you're adding in the tonic water in the coffee, you get this very nice kind of floating effect, which I will show you once all of you have your setup. Yes. Okay, maybe I'll help on this side. So you're only missing your coffee. And the ice, right? Okay, so only missing the ice here. There you go. Oh, okay. Okay, this side you all have your eyes, right? So only this side, okay. 
Okay, so each pair you will share one can of this, yeah? Each pair share one. Okay, because you won't be pouring in the entire can. So within your glass, you should already have your mango syrup and roughly about four to five ice cubes. Okay, the next is we are going to be pouring in our tonic water. Okay, so we just pour it in. Okay, roughly how much to pour? Do you notice for your glass, there's actually two lines over here? You see that there's two lines? Okay, I want you to pour it to the very first line. Okay, I'll walk around to show you. You see there's two lines here? Just pour it to this line. Yes, correct, over there. This line. So you see that there are two lines, right? Just pour it to the bottom line. Okay, do you see that there's two lines here? Pour to the bottom line. Do you see the two lines? It's kind of like a groove, right? So you pour. Alright, seems good. So you can see that there are two layers forming. You have your mango syrup at the bottom, and then you have your ice cubes and your tonic water. Okay, so next step, what we're gonna do is we're gonna dip in our chili, but don't do anything to the chili yet, okay? Just dip it in at the side like that. Okay, yeah, just leave it in like that. Okay, don't do anything to the chili yet. Okay, so let the chili sit in there, sizzle a little bit with the carbonated water. So this is an important part of the recipe, yeah? To extract out the flavors that we want. All right, all done. Okay, now next step, we will brew the coffee. So we're brewing the LTCO. So when, you comes, when it comes to brewing this coffee, one tip to note is that when you're brewing this coffee, Try to brew it in a way whereby when the coffee is extracting, you extract it directly on top on the ice cube itself because we want to create a very nice floating kind of layer. So let me just show you. So I'm going to remove the drip tray. Okay, so when you brew it, Okay, try to brew it in a way whereby the coffee will land on the ice cube instead of into the tonic water itself. So what this does is that it helps to reduce the impact of the coffee entering your glass. So that allows the coffee to float a little bit nicer. Okay, so you can see I'm adjusting my glass. Okay, adjust your glass in a way whereby when the coffee enters the glass, it's landing on top of an ice cube instead of into the tonic water itself. If you've done it right, you should be able to get this very nice effect where the coffee looks like a cloud. It's floating on top of the tonic water. Alright, very good. I see some of you doing very well. Okay, then once you are done, you just have to garnish it with the mint leaf inside like that. Okay, so I'll just go around and show you while you're doing preparing it. So you should get a very nice layering with the nice mint leaf on top. So it should look something like that. Alright, so I'm just going to go around and show you. Very good, very well done. This one also very good. Nice, beautiful. See, I, all of you are really experts on your first time. Very good. Yeah, just put it on top. Okay, so this is the part where 
if you want to take photo of your coffee, you can because this is where the coffee is going to be at its most uh, beautiful form. Okay, so after you're done taking your photo, then remember to stir it before you drink it. So I call this recipe the spicy mango mint cooler. And do you notice something interesting, fun fact? Do you know that all the ingredients are so inspired by the different colors that we have for the Virtual Pop? So your aqua mint machine represents the mint. Chili, of course, will be your spicy red machine. And then we have the mango yellow machine, signifying your mango syrup. And of course, the coffee will be black. Okay, so after you're done taking your photos and everything, if you want to, just give it a stir, okay, and then drink the coffee. Okay, if you want to get a little bit more of that minty effect, after stirring, you can even use the stirrer to muddle the chili a little bit. The reason why we don't muddle the chili at the start is because everyone has a different kind of tolerance for that kind of minty effect. So you can drink it first, but if you find you want more of that minty effect, you can use the recipe spoon to muddle the chili a little bit. But don't go too excessive, yeah? if not, it will overwhelm the flavors of the coffee. So this uh, recipe is a variation of the uh, Brazilian Caprinha, which is a little bit of a mix between a uh, mojito and a coffee. So it's very popular in a lot of uh, Brazilian Spanish bars to serve this kind of a uh, carbonated coffee. But since this is your first time trying, then I hope you're in for a pleasant surprise. Any one of you tried the coffee yet? If you have, can you share with me, was it something that you expect? Did you expect coffee with such strange ingredients to taste so sweet, refreshing, aromatic? Okay, because the reason why is because El Ticio as the coffee itself, it also has dark cocoa notes. So these dark cocoa notes actually harmonizes very well with the chili. And then of course, you have the tonic water, which helps to kind of like cleanse your palate a little bit. So one thing to note about spicy food is that usually the spice will linger, right? But the tonic water actually helps to slightly cleanse your palate so that the spice doesn't linger. At the same time, the mango syrup is there to give it a little bit more body and to add some sweetness to it. So it's like a perfect harmony of all these ingredients. So you see, this is a recipe that's very easy for you to recreate. And there's a bit of a wow factor, right? When you present this to your friends, you're like, what? what in the world, right? Chili in your coffee, tonic water, but you realize it's a very nice, refreshing recipe, especially with this kind of weather outside. All right, so I really hope you enjoy this segment of the Nespresso Masterclass. Of course, from this time, I'll be handing over to the next speaker, Seth, but please feel free to continue enjoying your coffee throughout the rest of the session. And of course, at the end of it all, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to ask any one of us, all right? So once again, thank you very much. My name is Samuel, I'm from Nespresso and I hope you enjoy the coffees that we have created for you today. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna use the mic then. Hi, so good afternoon everyone. I uh, hope everyone's enjoying your Nespresso coffee. And uh, thanks for not leaving and, and you know, checking out this uh, photography workshop we have next. So my name is Seth, and you may or may not have uh, seen me online in a good or bad way. But anyway, so uh, we actually create content about food in Singapore and uh, we have a whole team working behind the social media uh, channels and websites that we have. And I am here to share with you on uh, mobile phone photography and uh, being in the food industry, um, I will focus a lot of examples on food photography. Uh, and I think in front of you, you guys have coffee as well. So we're probably going to take some photos of the coffee that you have. Um, also, I'll be exploring some extra features that you can use on your, uh, okay, not your, but, you know, on the Samsung uh, S24, the Galaxy S24. Um, I'm not sure if everyone will get a, a phone to try out. Will everyone get one? Oh, I think we have enough 
handsets for everyone to try out. So yeah, there's some really interesting new features for the new phone. And I mean, it's a Samsung event, right? We've got to try a Samsung phone. Uh, so yeah, we'll go through that in a bit. Okay, so um, just, a, just a quick survey is everyone here like on a scale of one to 10 on photography expertise, where would you place yourself? 10 being like expert or professional. Shout, shout out, answer. Two, I see a two, five, three, 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 okay. What, a seven, is that a seven or two? Seven, seven, okay, okay. Ca casual, casual, all casual, right? Okay, okay, can, can. Same, same, same. We are casual, semi-pro only. Okay, so uh, this is the outline that we're gonna go through. It is sadly gonna be a bit of theory. There will be uh, features of mobile photography, We'll talk about food photography tips, and then we'll have like a quick practice session for the uh, coffee in front of you. Okay, so that's the rough outline of what's gonna happen. Okay, so first part is gonna be a bit dry. Uh, I'll try to just talk through this as fast as I can. Oh, someone's touching my butt. Oh. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah, keep on talking. Um, yeah, so if, you guys are familiar with photog ph ph photography. Hello, hello, hello. Wait, am I talking from the? Oh, oh, now it's oh. Okay, yes. Okay, now my hands are free. <coughs> right. So photography theory. The first thing we're going to talk about is this elements of exposure. So there are three things that affect exposure. And uh, for those that have dabbled in photography, you would be familiar with these concepts. So the first one is ISO, and then you have shutter speed, and you have aperture. Uh, is everyone familiar with these terms or not familiar? No, none, none at all? Okay, uh, you might have seen it somewhere on your phone sometimes, there's like these weird um, terms. Uh, but I will briefly run through what they mean. Okay, so not super important. There's no exam, so you know you, you can try to remember if you want. Uh, the first thing is called ISO, so it is actually light sensitivity. Okay, so the higher the ISO, the more sensitive to light the device is. Okay, and this affects graininess. So on this screen here, you can see. A low ISO, you get a clean image, and a high ISO, you get a noisy or grainy image, right? So in general, general rule of thumb is you want a low ISO when you shoot uh, on your camera or your phone. Okay, so this is what ISO means, is sensitivity to light. The higher the ISO, the more sensitive, the lower the ISO, um, the less sensitive it is. However, this, this is the after effects of it. Okay, so I mean, if anyone of you have shot for a digital camera uh, or stuff like that, they will actually advertise like, oh, it can go up to the da, da, da ISO. Okay, but having a high ISO, like 12,000 or whatever, 16,000, doesn't mean it's a good thing. Because even though you can go up to a high ISO, but you still get a very grainy image. So that kind of defeats the purpose. Okay, so. Um, a lot of these terms that you'll see in your phone, so we'll talk about the phone photography features, the phone camera features later, but it all originates from uh, the same concepts and some of the same technical terms that we are using. Okay, so the second concept, okay, I realize I can't turn my head. I need to turn my whole body. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, so the second concept we're gonna talk about is shutter speed, right? So it's literally the speed at which your camera shuts itself and the faster it shuts the less light enters the camera right and the slower it shuts the more light enters the camera okay does that make sense so the effect of this is that you need to match shutter speed with movement speed okay so have you guys ever taken a photo where your head is uh, still but your hands are blur Anyone? Oh, sorry, what? Oh, stand here? Oh, okay. Oh, got the speaker. Am I blocking the speaker? Okay, anyway. Yeah, okay. Anyone has ever taken such a photo before where your face is, 
you know, in focus, however, your hands or some other body part is like motion blurred, right? Okay, so that's basically because your head was standing still, uh, it was still, but your hands were moving, right? So the shutter speed didn't match, and that's why uh, it produces this blur. Okay, so the faster the shutter speed is, the less motion blur you will get. Okay, so generally in like sport photography or high speed uh, movements, like, uh, yeah, I can only think of sports at this point, or like F1, they have to use a fast shutter speed in order to catch the car uh, in motion. It'll just look like a blur, like uh, here, like you can see the below samples, yeah? So this is what it looks like. Um, and yeah, it influences the amount of light that goes in and also gives this uh, motion blur effect. Okay, the third thing is aperture. Okay, aperture is pretty basic. Everyone has sort of aperture somehow, somewhere. Okay, so uh, just to share, it's actually the opening in the lens itself. This is actually not the camera body itself, but it's actually from the lens uh, through which light passes through. Okay, so the bigger it can open, uh, the more light goes in, right? The smaller the opening is, uh, the less light goes in. Okay, so this also gives you this effect called bokeh or depth of field. Is anyone familiar with uh, these terms? What does bokeh mean? Okay, I'm sure you've seen the effect before, you just don't know what it's called. Any guess? The blur? Is it the blur? Wait, what, what do you say? Blur? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is the blur, the blur effect um, when your silhouette is in focus, but like the background is a bit blur, right? Does that make sense? So that, that is actually called bokeh or depth of field. Okay, so a deep depth of field means you can see deep into the photo. A shallow depth of field means there's that blur effect and you can't see the background. Okay, so they are, these, these are the technical terms uh, and in photography, a lot of them use the term bokeh as well to describe it. Okay, so for larger apertures, you actually see bokeh a lot more bokeh versus smaller apertures. Okay, um, and this part is a bit counterintuitive because the smaller the F number means a bigger hole. And the bigger the F number actually means a smaller hole. Okay, am, am I getting too technical on this? Anyone wants to guess why? Why is it a bigger number means smaller hole? And inversely is true. Sorry? Sorry? Uh, yeah, it's a yes, correct. So it's actually a fraction, right? So it's actually the, ah, um, oh, crap, I can't remember what is it. A lens length divided by uh, focal length, something like that. Lah. It's some formula, so it's actually a fraction. So if you divide by a bigger number, you get a smaller size, basically. Okay, so yes. Yeah, this is the idea, and you'll see bokeh being used even for uh, in mobile photography. It's actually a lot of it is AI generated. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit, but yeah, this is traditionally how it's done through the lens itself and having a uh, large aperture. Okay, so this is actually the effect that you get, right? With a large aperture, you get this shallow depth of field on the right, uh, so your background is a bit blurred out. Okay, and a small aperture, you get this deep depth of field. Deep means you can see all the way into the end of the photo, the back of the photo. So that is a small aperture and it's referred to as a deep depth of field. Okay, so um, generally if you shoot interior, so you want to use a, you don't want to use a large aperture with a lot of bokeh. Any guesses why? Let's say you're shooting like your house. Um, yeah, you have all the furniture and stuff. Why don't you want to use a large aperture? Any guesses from the front audience? Yes, because you don't want to just focus on like a chair, right? You want to see everything. So you want to have more, um, you know, depth of feel uh, basically. Okay, I think I'll just stand here. I can just ask you guys straight away. <laughs> Uh, so this is a quick recap of what the uh, three technical terms uh, do. So there are different effects. The first one is the bokeh for aperture. And then there's the motion blur, right? 
and the last one is the amount of graininess or noise on your camera. Okay, so it doesn't mean that you can use a high aperture is a good thing. Ah, sorry, a high ISO is a good thing. Uh, just take note of the noise that it introduces. Um, but generally, right, any camera that can go into a very big aperture, so you can get like f2 or f2.8 in that range, right, uh, the lens is actually more expensive. Okay, so yeah, just fun fact. Okay, so the exposure basically depends on all these three, uh, all these three factors we just talked about that introduce the appropriate amount of light. Okay, so too much light also, it becomes overexposed. Too little light is underexposed. So you need a good balance between all three of these factors. Okay, so um, I mean, I'm sure there's some math to it and a lot of it is experience also, but yeah, you just need to balance. For example, if you're using a large aperture, there's a lot of light coming in already then you don't need a high ISO. Okay, so you balance it with like a lower ISO. Tech team. Oh wait, okay, we're back. Yeah, um, what was I talking about? Yeah, so you need to balance the different factors of the exposure in order to get the appropriate exposure. Okay, so that's uh, roughly how exposure works in photography. Okay, so uh, now we're just going to quickly talk about different types of lenses as well. So you have a zoom lens, which is a lens that can zoom. So uh, yeah, you can basically go, the typical lens is going to be like 24mm to 70mm. You can just turn the knob and let you zoom. Uh, a prime lens is a fixed lens where you cannot zoom. There's only one focal length and you have to zoom with your feet. Basically, you walk closer if you want to shoot it closer. Okay, so Wide angle lens refers to anything below 20 mm in uh, lens length. A telephoto is those larger than 100 mm. Um, you see them at a lot of football fields where they have those giant lenses, right? Where those white color, it's typically the white color ones. Uh, those are telephoto lenses. And if you want to shoot like wildlife and all, you know, you cannot go too close to the animals. So you got to use telephoto lens. Okay, so and the last one is a macro lens where if you want to shoot like really close to something, like just to get the details, uh, then you use a macro lens. Okay, these are roughly the lenses. So the term macro also appears on your phones. What, what does macro do for your phones? Any idea? Macro lens. Have you guys actually used a macro feature on your phones before? Yeah? Uh-huh. Big depth? Pick F value, uh, yes and no. Uh, but basically, it allows you to shoot at a very minimal distance from your subject. Okay, so you can go very close. Okay, so without the macro lens feature, right, uh, a lot of lenses have a minimal focal lens length distance. So it'll, your phone sometimes prompts you as well, like, oh, please uh, maintain this distance from, or please move further away. I'm not sure if you guys have this method before. So my, my Android phone, uh, typically like, if I'm too close, it tells me, uh, please move further away from the subject. Okay, so yeah. Uh, because This is because lenses have a minimal focal length depending on how long the lens is. Okay, so the longer the lens length, basically you need to have a further distance away from the subject. Okay, and the wider angle it is, you don't have to go so, far away, you can shoot closer. Okay, so this also has a few effects. So uh, 16mm has this uh, very popular term. What's it called? It's named after a sea creature. What, what, what is the 16mm uh, effect called? Fish eye, yes. You professional photographer, right? Why well, you know everything? <laughs> anyway, so this, the 16mm gives you sort of a fish eye effect, right? Where it's rounded and uh, you have this, it's also known as warping, where it tries to squeeze your features into it, like the edges are around it. So the fish eye effect, it gives you warping. Okay, so some people might not want this effect, but this is a typical thing that happens when you use wide angle. Okay, and the uh, opposite happens when you use a longer lens, it actually flattens out your face. So it brings out like your ears more to the, front. Okay, so one other effect of 
using different lens length is the bokeh. So wide angle lenses do not have much bokeh. Okay, there, there's some physics here uh, that I don't know how to explain. But yeah, wide angle does not give you bokeh. Uh, but the longer lenses will give you more blur and bokeh. Okay, so these are the general features of lenses. Okay, is everyone bored of all these theory yet? But yeah, I mean, it's pretty boring. So let's go to mobile photography itself. Um, but just to understand, because uh, these terms will appear here and there, like, and it's good to understand uh, the basics. But the good thing is, that's not very important. With a mobile phone, uh, all this theory is unnecessary. So yeah, uh, thanks for spending 10 minutes with me. Right, so uh, I'm sure everyone has a mobile phone, right? And everyone has a camera. Uh, is everyone interested in photography? At least I, I would assume that's why you're still here um, and not like, you know, done with the coffee and leaving or tap out the coffee, right? So some of the mobile advantages of using a phone camera versus the traditional, uh, it can even be a compact camera or DSLR or even like mirrorless cameras. Uh, these are some of the things, right? So autofocus, of course, is, okay, a lot of cameras also have autofocus. Okay, but auto exposure um, is something built into the phones as well. And okay, nowadays, like uh, all the phones are coming with more and more lenses, right? Like the uh, S24 has uh, five, five lenses on the back, then a front camera. Okay, so basically all these, all these lenses is the different, so there's like a wide angle, there's like a macro, and then there's like a longer lens one. So that's why there's uh, multiple lenses generally on the cameras, right? So it can enable to you to do like macro shots, you can do like 5x zoom. This one's 5x, right? I think from oh, 10, 10, oh, sorry, 10, 10x, 10x, not 5x, 10x zoom and stuff, yeah, due to the yeah cameras and the lenses on it. Okay, anyway. So built-in lenses as well, so you don't have to like change lenses like compared to a typical camera. Uh, they're a lot more affordable, right? Uh, versus like, pro, like a semi-pro kit. And one of the big features of photography on mobile phones nowadays is AI tech, right? And I'll share a bit more on that because uh, the, uh, the Galaxy AI is actually pretty advanced. And okay, not pretty advanced, it's a lot more advanced than even like uh, the other Android phones that are out now. Okay, and I'll you know, demonstrate some of the features they can do. Uh, compact size, night mode, panorama, the petrol mode, okay? So all, all these things are in a mobile phone, uh, which can easily be accessed and used rather than using a professional camera, right? Or semi-pro camera. Okay, so editing is, is pretty easy, right? You can do everything on your phone. You take a photo on your phone and then you just edit. Okay, so easy exposure, the you can edit it. You can adjust the bokeh as well. So I think this is one of the features that's pretty pretty um, good on your phone, actually. So I think most Android phones have this feature. Uh, I'm sure the S24, uh, I, I shot this on the S24, la, so it has this feature. Everyone knows how to adjust bokeh on your phones. Any idea? Yeah, I think the first step is to take it in portrait mode. Yeah, then um, there, there will be a function where you can adjust the blur, the blur of it right, or the bokeh. So you can actually adjust the intensity of your bokeh or the blur on your phone. Okay, so yeah, this is literally the same photo, right, but because of the camera's technology, like it traces out and uh, kind of gives you a, a uh, simulated bokeh, right, and it allows you to adjust the intensity as well. Okay, so uh, these are some of the interesting features, right, uh, that you can do on your phone nowadays. Okay, so as mentioned, the the uh, we're gonna demonstrate a bit of the Galaxy AI powered uh, technology. So something very cool that I'll show you later, right? It can actually generate background and do a, a AI fill background. You can erase objects. You can move objects as well, right? With the phone easily. So okay, so we're gonna do a quick demo on this. This is a picture of noodles. Can you guys spot the difference in the photos? What's the difference? The balls? Is it the balls? Yes. Okay, so you can see that the balls are in different positions. 
Which one is the original photo? Is it left or right? Left. Oh, okay, the AI not not so convincing. Oh yeah, that one comes with it. Lah. I think uh, yeah, the AI uh, watermark is there. Um, yeah, it's just there. Lah. I could have photoshopped it out, but man. Okay, anyway. Hey, okay, but ignoring the watermark, ah, was it obvious? Was it still obvious? Okay, one yes here. Okay, I'm sure the watermark was a giveaway. Yeah, but all the uh, AI generated photos will have this watermark. Um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, let me do a switch to the phone screen now. Right, so um, here with me is actually the Galaxy S24 and I'm going to demonstrate like roughly how I did it. Right, so you can see my screen here. And the cool thing is that's an S Pen, so it makes it a lot easier to trace stuff. Okay, so you go into edit and then there's this sparkly AI thing here that you press. Right, it goes to this screen and then you can actually, um, okay, there's a couple ways to do it. One is you can hold it okay but this selects the whole bowl so i don't want that uh, the other way is to actually trace out what you want to shift yeah okay that didn't catch it directly but i just try to get it more come on include this yeah okay so you circle the ball now you can hold it and then you shift it yeah Okay, so it actually traces very fast and it's a lot more precise with the pen. Okay, and then you press generate. Okay, and then it works its magic. Uh, please note, uh, AI is not perfect. Uh. This one is, uh, yeah. But it's, it's pretty good. It's still quite convincing. So it's obviously a lot more accurate when it's on solid um, surfaces. Okay, so this one, we replaced it with it looks like a enoki mushroom, but okay, still kind of looks like food, right? So if I don't tell you that was like originally like a, a fish ball or a meatball, right? You wouldn't know, I think, or to me like at least, right? So this is just a demonstration of like how you can actually shift the, uh, you know, meatball easily, right? And yep, that's it for this segment. Okay, can we go back to the slides? Thank you. So I'll show you some other features uh, later on. Right, so you can easily move objects with um, the app and uh, removing objects is actually in a lot of Android phones now. There's an erase function, right? Um, so it's nothing new, but you can also erase it. Um, okay, th the next one, is, okay, this, this is the cool one, right? Where it actually uses AI to fill your background. Okay, so uh, have you guys ever taken like a tilted photo before and then you want to straighten it, right? So what happens when you straighten the photo? When you rotate the photo, you have to rotate the photo and what happens to your photo? It becomes cropped in, yes, right? So it has to crop in because, you know, the edges are empty, basically. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you what the, the Samsung phone the S24 can actually do uh, even with that limitation. Okay, can we switch back to the phone? Thank you. Um, uh, which photo was that? Right, okay, so this is the photo uh, I'm using, right? So you can see it's tilted, right, uh, based on the wall line is slanted to the right. Okay, so we're gonna go to the uh, generative thing here again. And on the, this, what do you describe this? Degree thing. Okay, so we're gonna turn it until it is agar, agar region, uh, okay, roughly straight. Okay, so in a normal circumstance, it has to crop in because it doesn't have all these edges, right? 
Okay, and then it, uh, you lose a lot of details basically. Okay, but with the um, Galaxy AI, this is this is pretty new. So, and it's actually very amazing to me. You better generate, and you can see the results. All right, so this is uh, the end result. Looks pretty natural, no? It even drew my legs. Like it drew me legs. And it can draw like your interior and all, and it, it all looks very natural. So this is one of the um, latest features on the Galaxy AI, and it's, to my knowledge, not on any other phone, phone technology. I know you can do it on like PC, desktop, um, is it on the pixel? The generative field one? Or the, this tilt one? I don't think there's the tilt one though. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I think pixel has the like, uh, you can yeah, circle and like change it thing. Yeah, but I don't think I saw the tilting uh, feature for the generative field. Uh, yeah, so it's actually pretty natural uh, to me, right? Even do my legs, uh, that's like amazing. Okay, can we switch back to the slides? Yes, and that is, uh, okay, the results vary. La. You can see here I'm wearing a different colored pants uh, on this try. And the one I just showed you live was black, black pants. So you can't decide what color pants you want to wear. Okay, so some of the key differences between a camera, a traditional camera or like a DSLR or like a mirrorless camera uh, with phone, uh, sensor size is one thing, right? So the Basically, the larger the sensor, the more light and data it can receive and process, and it will give you a sharper image. Okay, so on phones, of course, the limitation is the size of the phone. It can only come with a small sensor size. However, with the uh, processor chips and AI now, a lot of the these limitations are actually corrected by AI, right? So it can even give you like the bokeh, it can uh, smoothen out the noise and all just using technology, even with a small sensor size. Right, but generally, um, that's why cameras have to be that large because the sensor needs to have a certain size. Okay, but mirrorless cameras are smaller now because you don't need a mirror. Okay, anyway, so optical versus digital zoom. Also, uh, this is some is a concept uh, that you should know about. Um, optical zoom is when you actually depend on the the mirror or the camera, the lens itself to give you the real visual zoom. Right, but a digital zoom is enhanced. It's AI. So it's not like, yeah. So those like camera can do what like, 50X zoom uh, is actually a digital zoom. It's not a real uh, optical zoom. Okay, so that one's enhanced by uh, the processor or AI. Yeah, cause if you want to do a 50X zoom, that's like, you need a camera, like you need a huge camera. Like, okay, uh, you need a huge lens and yeah, a lot of it is actually done by AI nowadays. Okay, so rendering as mentioned, you can do bokeh, digital zoom, uh, a lot of low light enhancements, there's like the night mode you can do on your phones. Uh, one limitation though is that you can't change the type of lens. Okay, whatever you have on your phone is the lens that you have. Okay, but these are some of the uh, key differences between like a phone camera and a different, like an actual camera camera. Okay, so we're gonna go on to food photography tips, yay. So with creating, we are literally bringing something into existence that didn't exist before. There's a fun code that I stole from, from online. Okay, so okay, my number one tip first is to find the light. Always identify where is the light and head to the light. Do you guys take photos of food? Who here takes photo of everything they eat? Like every meal you eat something, you must take a photo. Anyone here? Are we in the wrong class? Or do you know someone that takes a photo, must take a photo before you eat one? Like you want to start eating, then the photo, then no, no, cannot photo first, feed camera. Right, okay, anyway, if you know someone like that, yeah, one advice is to find the light. Okay, so a lot of times the light will be at, beside the window, basically, right, or outdoors uh, in the sunlight. Okay, so find the light, soft light is the best light. Uh, I mean, I'm going to be very honest, the light here is not ideal. Okay, so number one is um, cause is warm light. Okay, so, uh, and then there's a bit of mixed lighting. So you, you normally you want soft light uh, and not like spotlight kind, um, which is very harsh and creates shadows. So you can see the shadows on your cups, right? Like it's quite dark. 
Okay, so you wanna you wanna find a bit of like soft light, uh, natural and not um, warm. Okay, so that's the ideal kind of light. Yeah, but have light. Okay, the first criteria is must have light. Okay, no light then uh, doesn't matter. Okay, photo angles. Which angle do you use for food? There's generally three different angles. Uh, majority of the time la. There's a bit of like five degrees variation la, But these are the three normal angles you take. Okay. So, when do you decide what angle to use for what food? Any guesses? Let's say uh, zero degrees, right? Okay, so you can see zero degrees. What kind of food would you take at zero degrees? Any shouts? Uh, what burrito? <laughs> uh, uh, okay, uh, mac and cheese. What? Mac and cheese burrito? Or oh, the Zach axis? Okay. Any, any, what, burger? Wait, who shouted burger? Burger? Coffee? Yeah, was that a breakfast burrito? Okay, never mind. <laughs> uh, coffee? Okay, maybe, yeah, burger. What else? So like, tall, tall things in general, are right? So you want to see the um, center of it. Uh, cakes, for example, like tall cakes. You know, you want to see the center. Um, yeah, generally. So what would be, Foods not to take at zero degrees. Pizza, yeah, okay, yeah, pizza, you'll just see the crust. Steak, uh, technically, if you cut the steak, can be done, yeah. Okay, but basically, yeah, flat, flat foods, you want to do flat foods. Okay, so what about 90 degrees? Okay, what, what do you take at 90 degrees? What kind of foods? Pizza, okay, yeah. Yes, pizza can do 90 degrees, correct, okay. Name something that has not been uh, shouted out. Rot roti prata. Yes, can, can, can is can. Oh, sorry? Mala, mala tang. Yeah, 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 can, can, possible, possible. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't want like a bowl food. You can, um, but you kind of need to lift out the food, lah, right? In your soup or your bowl. Okay, so and 45 degrees is a very generic, can't really go wrong kind of angle. La. Okay, so most food you can do in 45 degrees. Okay, but if you want to be a bit more artistic and not so mainstream, then you know you go for like a flat lay 90 degrees or like a zero degrees, like you know, more artistic style. Okay, but uh, just one one thing to note is when you do a flat lay or 90 degrees, right, a lot of it depends on the lighting. Not every lighting is suitable for flat lay, right? So if it creates like a lot of harsh shadows, like or cause the light is directly above you, then it creates shadows like down there, lah, right? Then that's not good to take flat lay. Okay, so if the shadow is being cast on the food you are trying to take, then it's not a good flat lay uh, scenario. Okay, so just take note of that. Yeah, but 45 degrees is most of the times you can do it. Lah. Okay, so portrait mode, I think earlier I mentioned about um, portrait mode. Uh, here I have a photo of the uh, old Nespresso, it's not the Vertuo, the new Vertuo, uh, uh, Hint Hint Nespresso. They sent me a new model. Yeah, anyway, so this is portrait mode on your phone. You can find it on your phone, like, literally called like portrait mode. Go to more or something, right? Uh, so that will enable you to have bokeh and you can also go and tweak the blur, okay? And the level of it. Um, so having this uh, kind of blur in your photos, will make it look a bit more professional and a bit more polished. Right? Okay, so why you want bouquet is also so it lets you emphasize on the object itself that you're trying to take, right? By blurring out the background. Okay, so contrast and depth. Why some photos look very flat, right? It's because they don't have contrast and they don't have shadows. So shadows are good. We want shadows. So if you, you see in the noodles, right? Can you see the noodles, the yellow noodles? Uh, this is a prawn noodle. Uh, you can see that it is in a shadow, but you can see the details in the shadow. Does that make sense? Right, so you want to have shadows, but not completely dark shadows. Okay, so um, a lot of times you want to shoot from a side angle as well. Okay, and there's this effect called... Um, okay, anyway, why, why do you not shoot with the light, let's say, directly behind you. It creates what? 
Yeah, yeah. So because the light is behind, then there's no light on your face itself, right? Uh, and it's not going to be a great shot, lah, right? And conversely, you don't want the light directly in front of you as well when you take a photo. Why is that? Yes, so your face will basically be blown out, lah, right? So there's a lot of light here, it's just very flat. So the, the problem with that is there's no shadows on your features. Right, so what makes a photo interesting is when you can see shadows and depth. Right, without shadows, you can't see depth. You will, will look like a 2D, 2D cartoon basically. Okay, and that's why it doesn't look good. So you do want contrast and shadows, just not too much. It's a balance. Okay, so yeah, avoid harsh uh, shadows uh, or highlights. Or basically, you can actually fix it in edits, lah. Hopefully, sometimes. Okay, use background. Right, tell a story. Right, based on the background that you're showing, um, can you tell where it is, what's the occasion? And basically try to clean up your background lah. if you are trying to shoot food. Okay, you can utilize props as well. Right, uh, sometimes you see random things like chili, got one chili plate there, uh, got a spoon, got a cup of tea in the background. Right, these are all like props you can use to make your photo look better. Okay, you want to show the essence of the food as well. So if you're shooting noodles or, okay, let, let me think. Um, let's say you shoot a Xiao Long Bao. Okay, what should you do with a Xiao Long Bao? If you want to shoot a picture of a Xiao Long Bao. Any guesses? Anyone try to shoot a Xiao Long Bao before? Sorry? Okay, hold up the Xiao Long Bao. Right, right, right. But what's the important essence of a Xiao Long Bao? The soup, yeah, the feelings, you know. Yeah, Xiao Long Bao's have feelings. So you need to show their feelings. Okay, so uh, this is one example, right? Uh, this is a Fuzhou fish ball. So you want to show that the fish ball has feelings inside, right? So you basically show the cross section uh, of what's inside. So show the essence of the food, right? They're showing a photo or you're taking a photo of ramen or noodles as well you want to pull up the noodles okay you want to show that there is actually noodles or ramen inside the soup don't just show a bowl of uh, soup right it's a very boring photo okay so these are ways to use uh, the thing and uh, as you can see from here right so don't be afraid to go close up right you can just go super close up and this actually looks pretty okay Okay, a lot of people shoot too far away and that's why it looks very empty. So this brings us to the next point, which is framing. Okay, fill the frame. Okay, so earlier I mentioned one way is to go very close to your food. Um, so when we have, when we're always training our writers on, on photography, one thing they were very worried about is actually cutting the shot, uh, sorry, cutting the uh, dish or the bowl uh, from your uh, shot. Okay, so it, it doesn't matter, it's okay one. You can go close and like not have the entire bowl or the entire plate inside. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, you can always cut it and fit it into the frame. Okay, so one way is to go up close. What's the other way which I am demonstrating here? How do you fill the frame? Okay, it's so a top down. Yeah, okay. What else? So here I'm actually using uh, a few props as well as yeah, I'm using props. And what else am I doing? Actually, what what do you think the props are? What are the props here in this photo? The teapot, yeah, the teapot, the cups, yeah. Okay, so these are things that we like plant inside lah, to fill up the space. Okay, so we also try to spread out everything, right? So there's no, there's no empty space in the photo, right? So that's how you can fill the frame, right? If you want to do a wide angle shot, you kind of need to fill it with relevant things. Lah. Okay, don't have like tissue paper or whatever in your photo. Okay, you want to have these uh, stuff. So you can get up close. Um, okay, leading minds, okay, we'll, we'll skip that part. Okay, but rule of thirds is a uh, framing concept that we'll explore a bit more in detail. How much more time do I have? Uh? Okay, uh, still a lot of time. Uh, okay, anyone has heard of the rule of thirds? It's a framing uh, concept, basically. Right, rule of thirds. So there's also this function on your cameras 
that you can activate uh, is the grid, the grid mode, lah, basically. Okay, so it divides your frame into three parts. Okay, so how does rule of thirds work? Right, is by framing your object in the intersect of the lines. Okay, so according to some psychologists, lah, right, the uh, is the most pleasing position when you have the object at one of these intersects, right? When I okay, I, I don't know why lah, but this is apparently the uh, the discovery made by psychologists years ago, and photographers have been following it for years. Okay, so it does look more pleasant, kind of yeah, sort of. Do you think it looks more pleasant, like rather than like smack in the middle? Cause like when I started doing photography, like I I just take photos like direct center Do like. Y'all think it's, it's a bit nicer? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So yeah, rule of thirds. Okay, so here we also demonstrate leading lines. So what, what, where's the line? What's the line that you are following? The sofa. Yes, the sofa armrest. Okay, so that is the leading line that we are following, right? So that is one way to use leading lines as well. And this is the rule of thirds. Okay, so you can also use the rule of thirds for horizon alignment. Okay, so if you shoot a sunset kind of shot or like beach, right, where you have the horizon, you can align it to one of the uh, horizontal lines as well. Okay, horizontal. Yes, horizontal lines. Okay, so this is how you can actually use the rule of thirds. So position your subject in one of the intersects. Uh, you can align your lines as well to the uh, horizontal lines. Okay, if you're doing a yeah horizon shot or even like a vertical shot, like you're shooting a what's called lamppost building lollipop ice cream. Okay, something tall. Yeah, then you can use the lines as well. Okay, so this is rule of thirds. Okay, generally for food photos, um, people prefer bright and vibrant colors. Okay, so it is more appetizing and it's more, um, yeah, basically more appetizing uh, and more heartwarming, right? Versus, what's that magazine that always does very plain? Kinfolk, Kinfolk. Uh. Anyone heard of Kinfolk? This magazine last time, I'm not sure if they're still around, uh, but their photos are very minimalist, uh, minimalist, desaturated uh, kind of shots. No? No? Okay. The yeah. older, older generation, no Kinfolk. Anyway, so generally people um, respond better to vibrant uh, photos. Okay, so warmer tones are actually better uh, to the eye or at least to Sing Singapore taste la. Okay, versus cooler, uh, cooler tones and temperature. Okay, so warmer is like orange, la. basically more orange, more reds. Cooler tones refer to like more blues. Yeah, so that's the concept of temperature. La. Okay, so this color warmth can be found on your edit settings in your phone as well. Okay. Uh, so you want to have soft shadows and highlights, you mentioned that. And you also want to crop and rotate to reframe. Okay, so the good thing about mobile or digital photography is even if you take it wrongly, uh, you can go and crop the thing to frame it properly. Okay, if it's slanted or whatever, right, you can always rotate and then crop it back. Right. So unlike like it costs you one dollar to take a photo when you did film photography like last time. Okay, so now um, mistakes are very easily corrected. Okay, and wait, let me think. I think that's most of yeah, that's pretty much all my slides. So this is what you want to do during editing process, lah. Okay, and uh, now we're just gonna go into practical exercise, right? Where you can take a if you grab some Nespresso coffee, you'll frame it and take a photo of your coffee layout. I think previously I have like, like a few examples of how uh, I did my coffee shots. So, you know, you can follow something like that. Um, any questions before we proceed? Then we just like, walk around and check your photos. Or oh, you guys want to try out the, uh, everyone have the S24 to try the AI generative feel. She pretty fun. All right, so I hope everyone had, uh, had fun trying out the new S24 and the generative AI technology. Uh, there are limitations to AI, but it is 
pretty fun. Uh, do if you do take any photos, remember to upload them on social media. There's some hashtags you can use. Uh, it's Galaxy S24 and the Galaxy AI. Um, but most importantly, do not walk away with the S24 phones. Uh, yeah, your, the security will have to chase you down. Uh, please leave the phones on. Uh, yeah, return it to the staff before you leave. And uh, this comes to the end of uh, the entire you know Nespresso and photography workshop. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. And I hope you can still fall asleep after like three coffees, man. That's, that's insane. All right, thank you everyone.